Hello, welcome beautiful people to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. This is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser, one of three reps from Brattleboro. How are you doing, Emily? Hi, Olga. <laughs> I just want to give listeners some context. As you know, based on um, the legislative cycle, we often pre-record our um, episodes. And I just want everyone to know, since we'll be talking about the end of the legislative session, that today we are recording on May 7th. This will likely air May 12th. And so nearing the end of the legislative session, who knows what will happen between Sunday and Friday. So just keep that in the back of your mind while we're talking. And um, I want to head over to Emily. One of the things we want to talk about is how and why some policy may make it to the end of the, fi the final vote at the end of the session and some may not. And it's going to be a little weedy, but the reason um, I thought it was important to talk about this is so often I feel, Emily, when it comes to the legislative process, when it comes to bureaucracies, when we don't understand them, they mm -hmm. become extremely frustrating. And this is a time of year where a lot of people have pinned um, hopes and needs and uh, funding on different pieces of legislation that may or may not make it. Mm -hmm. And it can be a real time of, of celebration, but also disappointment. Mm -hmm. And um, so with that context in mind, what are you sitting with right now? Whew. Um, how until we close the books, we really have no idea. Like we are a week out from adjournment um, and it still feels like pretty much anything is possible. Mm -hmm. um which is wild right like anything there are only a few bills that are still moving back and forth between the house and the senate but really anything could get put into any of them at this point both True. in terms of appropriations and in terms of policy um lots of promises could be made bargains could be struck and things could also disappear that feel definite there's also the governor is um threatening to be very active with his veto pen this year, despite not really um, coming to the table to discuss a lot of these issues in advance. Mm -hmm. And so it's also possible that things will sort of cross this finish line on Friday, get vetoed, and then for whatever reason, won't um, either come up for a, v a veto override vote or won't um, pass a veto override vote. Mm -hmm. So basically what I'm sitting with is that nothing is definite in this world. Mm -hmm. I'm also sitting with two, um, with history mm -hmm. and, um, just like how slow this process is mm -hmm. and how much it patience it takes. Um, but it's not like a sit back kind of patience and just watch the right. world go by. It's more right. of a keep on trying and realize that celebrating, um, there's some need to sort of celebrate the little wins, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's hard to even tell what those are. So um, a good example I'm gonna use and is um, my first, and I'm a little tired, so excuse my words are like a little bit more rambly than usual today. <laughs> um, my first year in the legislature, I was on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. Oh, wow. Boy, that was the before times. Yes. And um, I, another legislator named Matt Hill sat next to me in committee, and he was great. Um, and he had been in the legislature for quite a while, and he had been working on right to repair legislation. And so that is, you know... If you own a thing that you bought from a company, you should be allowed to try to fix that thing yourself. And the company shouldn't do things to keep you from being able to fix the thing yourself. It's like a very sort of like 
basic Vermont kind of value right there. Right. And, and there's a lot of warranties that basically say if you crack this thing open in any way, shape or form, it voids all the warranties. Including, you know, there's a lot of um, agricultural equipment that at this point, you know, like very, very, very expensive agricultural equipment that's actually set up. It's not just that it voids the warranty. It's actually that it's shut off by the manufacturer and you can't turn it back on. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's wow. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, little Bill, like it was just this thing he was working on. It was not like his whole life's bread and butter. It's just mm -hmm. the thing he was working on. He left the legislature. He sort of, I got excited about it. He handed it over to me. And for a couple of years, every year I sponsored this right to repair legislation and another Senator named Chris Pearson sponsored it in the Senate. Um, and Chris had been working on it for years and years before I joined the legislature too. So, and then like after a couple of years of sort of submitting like this big sort of big picture right to repair everything bill, decided to split it up and that always went to the Commerce Committee, decided to split it up and last biennium sponsored a right to repair agricultural equipment bill that went to the Ag Committee and a right to repair electronics bill that went to the Energy and Technology Committee. So last year, after like all of the sponsoring of this, the Agriculture Committee took it up, spent a little bit of time on it. All of these, like, you know, the John Deere's of the world descended on the state house. They stopped working on it. This year, though, House Agriculture, I didn't sponsor it. I handed it off to two reps because I'm not sponsoring very many bills now as a chair of the committee. Two reps sponsored it. Passed out of the Agriculture Committee, got referred over to the Commerce Committee, Commerce Committee passed it out, and your House of Representatives just voted in favor of it this week. Yay! No, if the Senate's even going to touch it, Olga. <laughs> okay, so little win on the House side. Little yeah. win on the House side, but also just like six years of just mm -hmm. my work. And like all those years of someone else's work before for like this thing that's just like so common sense. And so that's part of what this week is about mm -hmm. this, these times. It's like realizing that there are things that are like totally common sense, completely reasonable, but like you just need enough people to pay attention to it yes. and to pay attention to it long enough for it to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a season where like attentions get lost and all of a sudden something that didn't have any attention could get attention paid to it and it could make it across the finish line or people could be paying attention to something else and someone could sneak something in across the finish line um, or it could just like all drown under the weight of conflict. Mm -hmm. You and I had a, a brief conversation on Friday while you were driving back from the state house and you said, um, I, I think it was an interesting conversation because in one, I was uh, talking about the WGA writer strike mm -hmm. happening over in uh, the entertainment industry and also just like writers in the world. And it was making me think about where people put attention. And then you mentioned the concept of the Overton window, mm -hmm. which is a a concept where it talks about when it comes to government policy, a policymaker can only shift this window so far and that it usually takes people from outside the government to really push the window one way or another. And um, I think that is really important to ponder um, because bring it back to the WGA strike, what it brought back to me is those writers who aren't in the union mm -hmm. in some way have a greater chance to make change oh. when it comes to this, this strike because they're like the backup. So the mm -hmm. producers can go to these non-union writers and say, oh, hey, we can get around this strike. Just work for us. And if they say no, then then that, you know, it just shuts off more avenues for, for yes. getting around the strike. Um, but it's, where's I going with this? I don't know. That, that outside forces working on policy mm. and working on change um, 
how it really does take so many of us and how solidarity is such an important thing. Um, I'm cu curious for you in the state house right now with everyone so flip and tired, does solidarity come into the picture or is it kind of every person for themselves? Oh, um, that's so not where I thought you were going with the Overton window. Um, <laughs> what? That's a good question. You should though. know me well enough by now. Yeah. It's never a straight line. <laughs> um, solidarity. So yes, yes, I think there, um, there's certainly caucus solidarity and um, chamber solidarity. There's a lot of chamber solidarity this time of year. So people get very interested in like the House versus the Senate because, you know, we'll do this thing that we'll feel so proud of in either chamber and we'll pass it, you know, like I explained with the right to repair bill and feel like we accomplished something. Mm -hmm. But there's no guarantee that anything happens after that. And the other chamber is going to like mess with your stuff, right? Like that's <laughs> their job. Yes. But it still feels like you like had this precious little baby that you like dressed and nitpicked all of its legislative language and heard from all of these constituents about how important it was and talked to experts in the field. And then someone else is touching your stuff. You don't have any control over it really anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so that gets very escalated at this time of year. And it really becomes about like, what the house is doing, what the Senate's doing. And we do tend to like really focus in, we lose track of the governor a little bit. We lose track of like the long time frame a little bit. And we lose track of sort of constituents at home and impacts at home. Because mm -hmm. it just like becomes, it's always a bubble. I mean, anywhere we live, anything we do is a bubble, but like it gets yeah. very much bubble. And it becomes realer and realer sort of where that Overton window is that's mm -hmm. possible within the building. Because at this time of earlier in a year, it's possible to fashion the kind of compromise where people sit down, they figure out what sort of their end goals are and how maybe even like different sets of means could get them to the same end goal. Um, or finding shared ground and then sort of appreciating each other's boundaries. At this time of year, it's just like the kind of horse trading compromise that people I think expect in politics. Mm -hmm. So that's all there's really time for anymore. Um, and that's really, that's very narrowing mm -hmm. and that's very challenging. Um, yeah. And it leaves very little space for the kind, it like really narrows the window of possibility and leaves little space for the kinds of sort of comprehensive conversations that we might like to have with outside stakeholders or with sort of in broader solidarity with our communities. I find that interesting because this is, if I'm understanding it correctly, this is the first half of a biennium. Mm -hmm. So it's not like policy, if it doesn't make it through this first session, it can come back easier than it could in a new biennium in January, 2024. So I guess it surprises me that there'd be that much kind of a, of a lockdown happening on compromise. I think there's like this, um sort of political thread that gets built mm -hmm. um, of, you know, knowing that everyone's about to go home and tell, mm -hmm. the, and tell the story of what happened or mm -hmm. the governor's about to have six months of owning the media completely rather than just like owning 90% of the media completely. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the fact that like, you know, the budget is one of the greatest sort of, you know, um, documents that we share our values with and we do budget on a one-year cycle. Right. Um, so a lot of sort of what we value and what projects are going to succeed are sort of contained in that budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
I realize this, like I said at the beginning of the show, this episode will come out on around the 12th. Uh, you may have already adjourned at that point. But what do you think, sitting here a, a week out, what do you think is still possible? Oh my God, Olga, I have no idea. <laughs> so we're having um, some really much delayed conversations about emergency housing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, in the fall of the Joint Fiscal Committee, we did a lot of work to make sure we'd have enough money to continue the motel program through until basically now. Mm -hmm. Um, so that we'd have this legislative session to figure something out. Mm -hmm. No one figured anything out this legislative session. That's interesting. It is really interesting. It's How really come we could, okay, sorry, I'm going to take a, a sideline here. How come we could figure it out at the beginning of the pandemic, but not now? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was paid for all with federal dollars. Okay. And there's no federal dollars left. And everyone is really clear, including myself, that like, this isn't a permanent solution, right? This right. is like, but it's better than a tent by the river or mm -hmm. by the train tracks, right? And it's better until you come up with something else. And it's very, very hard to provide services to some, like we all know that the best case situation is supportive services mm -hmm. and permanent affordable housing. We know that we don't have enough permanent affordable housing. Mm -hmm. We know that's very basically impossible to provide services to someone who is not stably housed, even in a motel, right? Like a motel yeah. is stably housed enough to provide services. Um, but it's incredibly expensive to continue the motel program. And everyone thinks it's sort of a nightmare, right? Like there were all those headlines about what happened in Rutland. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of sort of like small town politics that feed into yeah. people's feelings about the motel program. But again, it's like, better than having thousands of people camping in like the corners of the streets, right? Mm -hmm. For those people, most of all, but also for whole communities and public health and all those things. Right. Um, but it's one of those situations where like there needed to be like some really serious strategic planning about like, this is how many units we need of emergency housing. This is how many units we need of transitional housing. This is how many units we need of permanent housing, this is the timeline that we need to get there, and how long we'll need each of these things for. More people are losing their housing every day. It's not like a stable population. It's like people find housing and people lose housing every day. Yeah. And we know that the, you know, we need to invest the most in the permanent housing, right? Because that's the permanent solution. But it's just one of those cases where like no one quite owned the problem. The administration didn't ever show up at the solution that was asked of them. Um, a lot of transitions and a lot of offices, both on the, you know, from advocates and um, in the administration. And it's also an issue that sort of sits across a few committees. Mm -hmm. And so right now it's like really like, that's like one of the big sort of sticking points in the budget. And it's something that a lot of people weren't paying attention to. And so I was really surprised because it's something that I pay a lot of attention to how few of my colleagues didn't seem to know that this was happening or what the impacts of it were happening. Um, I think people thought that like some people were about to be homeless, but like most people who were vulnerable wouldn't be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's been really interesting to sort of see again, like what you said about the, your attention now to what's being paid attention to, how this, how this time of year, we start to shift our attention and what yeah. we're paying attention to. Um, well, so I also appreciate that context because it brings us back to that point of, you know, if you're standing on the outside, like my question, but they solved it during the pandemic, why can't they solve it now? And that lack of context can be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank and you. And I think that. another thing that's really frustrating for folks on the outside, and I see this with constituents in Wyndham County all the time. Mm -hmm is I think we all assume that Vermont's like the part of the Vermont we live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. I think people in Franklin County are saying like, why are, you know, but these are the needs in this area. Like these are the priorities in this area or folks who like live in rural areas where homelessness is invisible mm -hmm. or folks who's like all of their neighbors are making $40,000 a year versus $150,000 a year. Like you might see in certain areas of Chittenden County. Right. 
And so everyone thinks that their community is what Vermont is. And they're so surprised that like the legislature isn't doing what their legislator would do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant point. We forget how <laughs> for such a small state, we are kind of 14 little countries crammed into a, into a state. I guess. I mean, I do think it's true. It's just... Um, I think we could do better to sort of talk across that difference and understand. Oh, yeah. What we do sometimes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's sort of a funny thing because people will be like, write me emails. And I'm like, yes, I care. I'm doing the very best I can to get that across the finish line. Unfortunately, like, you know, not all my colleagues are in the same place as we are here in Brattleboro on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, not a monarchy around here. No. no. Which is a good thing. Except Which for is the a hats. good thing. Oh, the hats are kind of fun, aren't they? I suppose. <laughs> the fascinators. Um, yes, the fascinators. <laughs> so that's something that happens this time of year, sort of the something will become very sharply into focus and be like the thing that the negotiations sit on, even though it's something that like people weren't paying attention to or something that um was sort of in the background and sizzles up to the front, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, after the break, I wanna talk a little bit about how things are different for you now that you're a chair of a committee mm -hmm. versus when, when you just served on a committee. Mm -hmm. um, but in the five minutes we have before the end of, of this segment, I'm, curious given how exhausting this end of the session can be for very good reasons I mean mm -hmm. I think I said to you earlier it's a sprint and a marathon at the same time mm -hmm. what what keeps you going like what's going to get you <laughs> over the finish line <laughs> um besides your very awesome nail polish Thank you for video folks <laughs> or for audio folks. I got some bright red nail polish to get me through. Um, but more of what gets me through is sort of some conversation, some combination, excuse me, of that Overton window and um, like a lot of visualizations of rivers. Mm. So I don't know what thing or change or sentence I'm going to communicate that's actually going to be the one that shapes policy long term. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you drop pebbles in a river or um, even logs in a river, right, you don't, it shifts the flow of that river a little bit. And that shifting of the flow of the river a little bit shifts other opportunities available in that river, right? Right. And similarly, the Overton window, um, what is it that I'm able to do on a day-to-day -day basis and in terms of getting policy across the finish line or sort of incrementally forward is going to shift what's possible next, mm -hmm. either for me or for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even when we were talking about, we were talking about changing our legislative pay structure a little bit. Mm. And what I've been reminding my colleagues is this isn't about what's going to work for you. This is about what's going to work for the people who can't even pull it off to get here because of how incredibly absurd our existing pay structure is. Right. And so that thinking of like those shifts that make space for the next shifts is a lot of how I um, center myself and make it through this time of year. There's also like a fair amount of very unhealthy eating and <laughs> some like pretty inappropriate snark that I regret immediately after it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> so instead of a swear jar in your committee room, you have a snark jar? No, no, no. I don't say it. I don't say it aloud in committee. I do okay. like control myself well enough for that, I think for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> And I tend to not eat the cheese doodles in public all that much either. Oh, well yeah. then, cause you got the, the funny yeah, colored it's fingers. No good, and, especially yeah. with the red nail polish and the orange cheese dust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I hear you on the cheese doodles. Those are, those are good stress eating mm -hmm. snacks. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, and then it's, very- you know, like, there is the, it's really, you know, earlier in the session, there's a lot more space for like telling the stories of constituents. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it's really easy to get sucked into the bubble of like the football game of it all or the sausage making of what it all. And when I do hear from constituents about just like, uh, hey, thank you, this is still important to me. That like, it's not even the gratitude that makes it possible. It's like the recentering in the fact that this impacts people's lives. Mm-hmm. Because I can't actually carry around how much impact it has on people's lives all the time. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's too much responsibility. It's an overtaking of responsibility Yeah, because of that river, right? But the responsibility is why I do it. And so um, I'm always like sort of balancing, remembering it without becoming overwhelmed by it. Thank you. That That is a, um, I appreciate you saying that. So we at the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. We need to hear from some of our underwriters. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on Brattleboro Community Television, and thanks to them, you can also find us on many of the PEG stations around Vermont. So thank you, BCTV. You can find us wherever you subscribe to your podcasts, although I apologize, folks, I've fallen a little behind, but I promise I will catch up on my editing. And You can also find us at the Montpelier happy hour at gmail.com. Should you ever want to drop us an email and Emily, Mm -hmm. what shall we remind our listeners of? As a matter of fact, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier happy hour are those of the host and the guests respectively, not the station, not the platform, not their employers, nor friends. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know we are at the end of the legislative session. I'll say once again, we're recording this on Sunday. It will air on a Friday. So um, a lot of things can change between then and now. In fact, Before that's we- what we're talking about is how much things can change between <laughs> then and now. So for <laughs> listeners, it might be a really good object lesson to see what changed between then and now. Or oh, we, now we should then. maybe create a bingo card or something. Yes. <laughs> End of session, bingo. Um, Before we talk about some things that are still up in the air though, Emily, I wanna talk about some, we we often tongue in cheek talk about the need to drown the policy babies Mm. at times. And you were talking about how different the process has become for you since serving on a committee to now you are chairing a committee. Mm Um, and and the different decisions that can make when it comes that that can create when it comes to whether or not policy makes it in a certain shape or form. Could you uh, elaborate on that for our listeners, please? Yeah, and first let's sort of explain the phrase a little bit because I think a lot of other legislators have like much more appropriate ways of describing this phenomenon, but. Representative Matt Treber, former representative from Rockingham, a um, kind of extraordinary character, very smart, very smart, straightforward to a fault, (laughs) um, wily, sort of confusing politically in a lot of ways. Um, Anyway, Representative Matt Treber, maybe my third week in the legislature. So I am like, you all remember, I was so idealistic going into this, realistic, like understood how, like how bureaucracy works. I knew how limited the capacity of the legislature was, all of those things. But I, you know, I was still filled with like hope and a lot of confusion because it was three weeks into this thing. Matt Treber comes up to me in the hallway. He's much taller than I am. I am looking up and he said, Emily, to survive in this building, I want to like give him like a raspy Lauren Bacall kind of voice, but he didn't have one. He didn't. But, but that just would pretend have been awesome. that he had a Lauren Bacall kind of voice. 
Casablanca, anyone who mm-hmm. does not know who Lauren Bacall is. So, Never have not. and he says, to survive in this building, you have to be willing to drown your babies in the bathtub. And I was like, oh my God, you are the meanest, meanest man that has ever lived. He may have just been the most realistic man who ever yes. lived. <laughs> and so what does that mean? The drowning of the babies in the bathtub? It's um, one, you need to be able to sort of survive and be resilient to a lot of things that you put a lot of work into and care really deeply about not making it across the finish line. Mm -hmm. Drowning. You also have to be willing to let things go in order to get other things done. Mm -hmm. That's the drowning the things yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's also a theory of legislative work which I have doubts about, which is that if you show people what you care about, they will use it against you and you will lose. Oh, whatever. And I... I I mean, afraid that might be true in some situations, but I think it's, I, I think that's a BS way to create policy. I still refuse to believe that that is true. I'm going to continue showing all of my cards at all times and hope it works out. But, you know, it might not. Um, And so those are sort of all, that's the story of the drowning babies. Um, I'm going to add quickly something. We have the same concept in probably a lot of fiction writers have been told uh, you have to be willing to kill your darlings. And the concept behind that is there may be things that in a screenplay or a novel that you love a line of dialogue, a character, whatever, but they may not be what's best for that final story. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be willing to kill something you love for the better of the, um, the final story. And so I think there's some of that in policy too. There may be things that you absolutely love, but at the end of the day may not serve the community in a way it needs. Or may just like not have any chance. And so you have to let it go (laughs) because it's just life. Like, right. It's not like, I mean, I think a huge amount of what doesn't pass in a given year would serve the community incredibly well. It just mm-hmm. doesn't have the political, enough political will behind it. That's too bad. And like, I, yeah. I mean, if we were just like <laughs> rating how much the things that are on the wall would like improve people's lives, totally different conversation we'd be having here. I think we should create that. Next session, let's okay. create a rating system. You, okay. me and John Walters will create a rating system. Okay. um oh but what's funny about that writing thing is so when I'm working on something I will often have often have a second document that I will cut things out of the first document and paste them into the second document so I don't have to delete them Mm. and so I can like release myself from that um killing my darlings thing and know that like that awesome sentence is going to work out in some other place. Yep. This doesn't belong in this place. And yes. similarly, the policies don't actually ever die. They have the next session. They even have the next biennium. And like, it's all, you know, it's hard because it's like, how many people will suffer in the meantime? Because I think a lot of us right. are there to be alleviating suffering or to be fixing broken systems. So, mm-hmm. but what's different now? So like back then, I would mostly just like get attached to something and then my baby would drown and I would be sad about it. And often would be like, oh my God, I've won. Oh, no. <laughs> Someone else drowned it. Mm-hmm. I didn't even see it coming, that drowning. You know, that was like a sneak drowning or like everyone knew that it was going to make it like everyone was sort of letting me get it this far, but no one thought it was going to get any further, which is why they let me get that far or it got traded away or it passed, whatever, but Mm -hmm. mostly. So that's how the babies drowned before. Now I'm the chair of the powerful ways and means committee. (laughs) And some people think that means that I am one of the most powerful people in the legislature, which might or might not be true. 
But I think people think that if that's true, that means that I get all my stuff. Right. All Which your babies make it to the finish line. True. It's so right. unfortunate, Olga. Because if I got my stuff, stuff would be great. Like, <laughs> things would be great. I was saying at the beginning of the show, this was not a monarchy. <laughs> But I have no doubt. Yes, things would be good. <laughs> yes. Perfect. No, not perfect. But like so much better. There are some things I just like don't pay that much attention to. But, you know, there would be some good stuff happening. No, it just means that I'm sort of like responsible for negotiating the will of 180 people. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that I like get to exert my full will and power upon 180 people, unfortunately. Not a monarchy, monarchy again. <laughs> no fascinators right no derby no monarchy no fascinators um and so I'm the one who has to like tell the members of my committee that I've been working really hard on something that it's not going to happen and it's experienced as me drowning the baby or um you know recently the house sort of made it clear that we are not going to be able to get family medical leave across the finish line in the Senate this year. And, you know, to break it. You know how hard you've worked on that. Yeah. Yeah, I have. And like, you know, there's been opportunities in that to bring a lot more people into the legislative process and to like, see how to talk about family from like a non-heteronormative straight, non-straight perspective and to like, you know, shift the window a little bit in some of those conversations about like what it means to value care. And like, I'm really hopeful we'll get it passed next year. Right. Um, and so like had to tell my caucus that like, mm-hmm. clearly I'm not like drowning the baby, like, you know, I'm drowning some of the babies I love too. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, even, you know, I'm not always drowning them like to get something else. They just like drown under the weight of all the things we take on. Right. So that's what's different and it's like really it's hard to be out in front of something and then have it you know disappoint Mm -hmm. yeah and I bet that's a shift you did not see coming when you took over the chair did you Mm, I don't know what I thought this would be like anymore I'm still really grateful to do it but um I don't know if I understood how that particular shade of attention would be tiring in the way it is Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for, for sharing that perspective, Emily. Curious, what are some of the things that are still up in the air? Mm. Like, and I will just say, I am surprised that family medical leave is still up in the air or that it likely won't, won't pass the, the Senate. Like I just, I thought that was a done deal mm-hmm. um, from the outside looking in. I think also um, the clean heat mm-hmm. standard um, so the thought. Affordable Heat Act has been passed by both chambers, has now been vetoed officially, mm-hmm. and we are going to try to override a veto sometime this week before we adjourn. Um, but that doesn't just take some really concerted teamwork and the ability to withstand a level of lobbying and misinformation that has like ratcheted up from even in the days when we were doing our first vote. It also takes everyone being in their seats at the same time. Right. <laughs> right. I think, you know, we talk about the Democrats having a, a super majority, but that doesn't mean that they have automatic veto override power. No, and we have a very um, quite young and diverse group of legislators and so people it's like the end of the session the pressure from the outside is ratcheting up like employers have lost their patience with our lack of attentiveness to our work Um, families have lost their patience with lack of attentiveness to the home people's health often has not been tended to in a while we are all like breathing on each other all the time um seriously like so much sickness running through the building. I believe it. And very gross. And so it's like, it is genuinely a challenge to just have 105 people in their chairs all at the same mm-hmm. time. Yeah. So that, you know, like 
we wonder why policies live or die. Sometimes it's something as simple as that. And like, you know, we're seeing that with Diane Feinstein Stein, but like, it's also, you know, tiny versions of that happen every day. Um, so that's the Affordable Heat Act. And then childcare. Yep. You know, it's been a five years of a sustained public information campaign from Let's Grow Kids. A lot of very sort of complicated policy is rolled into how we're just really expanding an existing program. Mm -hmm. Like we already have childcare financial assistance that reimburses centers for how much, you know, how much they should get paid for caring for kids. We're just like putting a lot more money into that system in order to make it work maybe. Um, but how we're going to pay for that is still very much up in the air. The House has not voted a bill out yet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not clear if the House and the Senate are going to be able to find agreement on what a progressive revenue source is for funding that. And then there's also some different policy pieces rolled into that. Um, S-100, which is the big sort of housing zoning reform bill. Oh, right. Yes. Um, seems to be doing OK for now, but who knows? What will happen there? It seems to like attract trouble, like a, I don't know, moon, <laughs> like a heavy gravitational moon. Yes, and, like it has its own weight. Something. Yes, um, and then there are like all kinds of other things, like you know, legal reform for schools around school safety that could just like one senator could sort of drown other things because of that or one house member because drown other things because like all the issues all wind up very interrelated. And then there's the budget, which will right. likely be vetoed. I know we've hardly even talked about the budget on this show, uh, but yeah, it's likely to be vetoed. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we already have our veto session scheduled in June. Ah, okay. Well, I mean, I'm not surprised. Uh, whether you agree with Governor Scott or not, he does tend to use vetoes quite often as part of his policy toolkit. Like at a magnitude that is historically unseen in the state of Vermont, like yes. so many more vetoes than any other governor ever. In fact, I would say it's one of his major tools he uses to for policy change. Seems to be his perhaps only tool that he uses for policy change. I'm realizing <laughs> well, that not like, showing up. What else does he? <laughs> What else has he done recently? He also really loves, I get all of his um, press releases. Mm -hmm. He loves to take credit for things that the legislature funded in our budget or programs we created. Or like ARPA money being spent. Governor Scott announces grant winners of blah, 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 grant fund awards. Mm -hmm. Like we wrote the guidelines for those grants put them in the budget oh we don't have a communications team to write press releases whenever any money gets spent that's true so it's in legislature right there baby mm-hmm mm -hmm. mm -hmm. maybe uh once you take care of the compensation package you can get more legal aid more assistance and a communications team yeah i don't know i mean that's like last on the list i think but maybe <laughs> But he, I put it last on the list. Yeah, no, you did. I mean, I have other things I would put in between that we didn't talk about, but um, because it is actually really, really important that Vermonters know what we do, right? That's yeah. like part of the democratic process is that Vermonters actually like it, the participation works best when people know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so understand me the writing like and how you got there. Yeah, no, like me writing updates on my email once every few weeks is like not, not a communication strategy. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And um, anything, any any highlights in the budget, since we haven't been talking about the budget very much that you just want listeners mm -hmm. to understand or. Yeah, so um, I've been thinking a lot about care lately. I've been talking a lot about care lately. So there was the family medical leave bill there is this big investment in childcare spending that's um, in the budget. There's universal school meals. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's this big increase in Medicaid reimbursement rates right, in right. the budget for like folks like home health aides, mm -hmm. um, folks who are like um, programs and individuals who are providing like direct service care mm -hmm. will see a big bump in their pay because of this Medicaid reimbursement rate change. And that feels huge to me. So it's like all part of this package from my perspective of saying like, we are going to value the women who carry our whole society because they're doing the care work, right? Yeah. yeah. And for me, that's what all of those bills are about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We, um, I know I've asked this before, but I am always fascinated when a process begins, mm -hmm. what we expected. Mm -hmm. And then what the reality is, um, we, you know, bringing this back to some woo woo feng shui, you know, when you look at the five I elements, love, I just have to say, like, you don't need to put woo woo before feng shui, like it's already woo woo, like it's, it's already like, woo woo. It's already woo woo. Yeah. So <laughs> go on. So when you have the five elements in Chinese medicine, you start with water, you go to wood, you go to fire, you go to earth, you go to metal. And what's interesting is water is where like a dream may begin. Wood is where you grab your resources. Fire is your um, doing. Earth is when something actually becomes real. And then metal is where that reality becomes refined. Oh. And why I find that so fascinating is when we are standing at the beginning of a process, like standing in the river, we can't see necessarily the mountain that, you know, or the earth that mm -hmm. that process will create. We might think we know, but we don't know, actually know until we get there. Um, and so for you, at the beginning of the session, what has shifted? You know, you went in with your expectations and now you've come out the other end and we're not fully in earth even you know a lot of things still aren't quite real torn between asking a lot of questions about how chinese this chinese medicine chinese spirituality thing mm -hmm. lines up with tarot but i am not going to do that oh but we could have that I conversation got a little lost in there for a minute in my mind so i'm trying to bring myself back because, you know, I pull a tarot card every morning before I go down to the legislature to just like have some centering. Mm -hmm. um, but what I am going to say is that I think there was a real tension this session that's played itself out between this idea that like we have a super majority, we have this like youngest, most diverse group of new legislators ever. There's been so much change. There's so many new chairs. There's so much new happening in the building. There's so much change out there in the wider world. And are we going to use all of that change to get stuff done? Mm -hmm. To like test the theories that we've been playing with? Or in the midst of all that change, do we need to like reground ourselves in like conservative governance and stability mm. and um, not let us like, it felt like everyone was sort of scared of, a lot of people were scared of tipping over this here. Mm. Oh, interesting, okay. And um, getting out, a lot of um, legislators talk about getting ahead of your skis. Oh, getting, yeah, getting your, um, over the tip of your skis. Yeah. 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 So I think I went in being like, okay, like we've learned our lessons from COVID, but we're like stabilized medically a little bit. The economy is, we have tested like a major theory of economic change and it's worked. Let's like get it done. 
Um, and I understand my colleagues who are like, wait, like people are trusting us with a super majority. Let's not go too crazy. Let's not get too wild. Um, <laughs> and so oh, the mind images of the floor of the house, not getting too wild. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Someone made Wookiee sounds on the floor on Friday. Things get like a little wild at the end of the year, but all to say, yeah, I think that's the, that's sort of the difference between part of what, what was planned and what has happened. Mm. Well, that's an, that's a tough conundrum. Um, sometimes after upheaval, you need to um, take a breath and yet you also still need to legislate and create policy. So where does that breath happen? I don't know. In the world, it is always changing whether we want it to or not. Mm -hmm. This is true. Mm -hmm. What is. should we leave listeners with? I think we should leave listeners with the idea that the river is there for them to come plan. And so we can all put our pebbles down. We can all like stand in the summertime, water and talk to each other. We can put the pebbles down together. Um, but what happens this next week, who knows? But after that, it's like really up to all of us to be keeping on having these conversations. Yes. I would add to that because I, I loved what I read up on the Overton window after you mentioned it of how much it really does take outside forces to, to move that window. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that we can keep building a community where people have more time and resources to help move that window. Me too. I can I leave one example of the Overton window that I think might be mm -hmm. helpful? So, um, you know, Occupy Wall Street is really what I think sort of shifted the window so that Bernie Sanders message mm -hmm. could resonate, which had this incredible sort of um, created, also created space simultaneously for Black Lives Matter um, mm -hmm. and a real movement led by you know, garment workers and domestic workers. Um, and what that all has made possible, I don't think we are even aware of yet. Yeah. But I'm curious to see how all of that that we've seen happen nationally, but see, like, is going to come home to Vermont. Because mm -hmm. we vote for the man over and over again. Mm -hmm. But we seem to not... Um, necessarily tell our state level elected officials that's a, that's what we want to see here. Right, right. It's a very good point. On that note, the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW, one hundred seven point seven LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. We will return next week. Until then, take care. <laughs>